survey. It's like if you got to. If you want to do it, I guarantee I'll respond. Oh, yeah. And, and if you do it, I guarantee I'll respond. And so, <laughs> and so will I. I will, uh, I will help. I will beat the bushes, but I be don't have time to run the whole thing right now. What would be neat is um, if we could do a survey where we find out what people are doing for a living right now, what they'd like to do for a living, and what topics they suppose would be key to moving them from where they are to where they want to be. Yeah, things that things that SFS can provide um, training and experience in to help them to get the job of their dreams. Um, you can run with it. So. Mm -hmm. I, I will gladly put it together, but I need to start taking notes because my memory is about this long. Yeah. Don't mind. I so. Mean, how, how big of a mailing list? Do you oh, it's not. Oh, yeah, two two hundred people maybe. Is it? Maybe yeah, the responders are significantly <laughs> less. Yeah, significantly less okay. than that. Okay, so one more time. What they're currently doing. What are they what are they currently doing? Um and uh if they want to talk about their salary, um and what do they want to be doing and what's their salary goal and what if anything uh, can SFS provide training and experience in um, to help them move from where they are to where they want to be? Um, because one of the things that I firmly believe is that training by itself is not uh, terribly useful. It's fine to sit in a classroom and talk about stuff, but until you actually get out there and start wrestling alligators, um, you, you don't know what it's like to wrestle an alligator. And the, the, the fact is that talking about wrestling alligators and drawing pictures about wrestling alligators and getting a stuffed alligator out and pretending to wrestle it, it's all very clean and predictable. And then when you wrestle a real alligator, you find out that the alligator wants to win, and it's a mess. Well, that didn't go as planned. <laughs> no battle plan survives contact with the enemy. Um, all right, so let's see. We are, we're not done rallying. Four more minutes. Four more minutes, and we'll be done rallying. I don't know what happened to the rest of our students, but that's okay. I have a quick question for you. You're the only person that hasn't told me that it's okay to release session one oh. into the public. It's in the recording from last week, yes. Oh. Absolutely it is. Okay. You're, you can release it publicly. Okay, and for tonight, are you hiding from the Secret Service? No. Okay. That you know of? Are you, are you hiding from the Secret Service? Not that I know of. Okay, all right, so since our faces are the only ones on, is it okay with you guys if I put this recording on YouTube's? Yeah, yes, that's fine. Okay, all right. I, I never, I try never to make something public. Semi-public I'll do, but I try never to make something public without making sure that everybody's completely yeah, cool that. with it. Because um, you never know who's hiding from the Secret Service and maybe they're hiding for some silly reason like, I don't know, whatever, choice of business. Um, three more minutes to rally. Come on, Rich, show up tonight. Alex Wise has other shit going on, so he's not going to show up. And who's the other person? Is or is that it? Last week? No, that's so that's four? five. Five. Yeah, there's no. There's one more. Literally sitting where you are. Okay. There's one more person that I'm not thinking of. Robert. Was live. Robert. That's it. So where's Robert? Robert should be him too. I find live interactive to be the best way for me to learn. Absolutely. It, it's way, way, way more engaging. It's like, it, well, nothing lets you know that you're important to the other people in the room, like being in the room with them. Yeah, it's, it's, 
This place is actually on the way home from my office, so it's like perfect. Oh yeah, and I live like a mile from here. Oh, okay. I mean, I'm not here. I'm like 285 in Lawrence, so I'm not far. So. Yeah, I'm between Sheridan and Lawrence. Oh okay. Offhand. Oh okay, cool. Yeah, I'm right. You know where Mojo Wheels is? Bear Valley Coffee. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, nice. Yeah, very cool. I'm uh, I'm like between Wads and Kipling, on the Lakewood side. Yeah, uh, like so you're in Bear Valley. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. Closer to Yale, though. Yeah. Ro not robbery, Robert. You're definitely all for Linux, huh? <laughs> oh yeah. Oh yeah. Um, I'm really I'm all about free software. Linux happens to be the best known piece of free software. Do you, how do you like System Seventy Six? Love them. Yeah, Love them. They're. they're Have you been in their shop? No. They, uh, honestly, the first time I heard about it was in the mailing list just uh, last week or something. Like, yeah. I got it. Excellent. It's downtown. You need to check. Oh, okay. They're right on 16th Street Mall. Yeah. Uh, wow. Second floor. I can't remember the cross street, but. Yeah, yeah they're, they they're, have their own OS, don't they? At least a version it, of it. It's Ubuntu Pop. reskinned. But yep. Uh, okay. Yep. It's a, an Ubuntu derivative uh, named Pop OS. And they've made some small. Uh, Design changes, but I was wondering about that because they are a contributor. So you want to? Uh huh. Oh, okay. So I think they work with drivers and stuff because they they're now actually going to be making their own laptops here in Denver. I love that. I'm very interested in that. They probably won't be cheap, but yeah. Um, oh, Did I? That's pretty cool. <clears throat> I so didn't can you realize choose? I met the guy at a launch party a couple years ago, the CEO, I guess, Carl? He's the owner. Super nice guy. Okay. And I was chatting with him for a few minutes, and later I realized that is the super nice guy. Yeah. All right. I'm sending their release party announcement out to the SFS list. So when, so when you do a, a System76, do so you get to choose like Ubuntu or their own OS or like, does it just come like where you install and install Red Hat stuff? Well, you can wipe it and install whatever you want. I believe it's going to be Pop OS and you may have a, depending on the where it is in the cycle, you may be able to choose from like the Bleeding Edge 17 dot series or uh -huh. long term okay. one back 16. Gotcha. I think that's how it works. I've not bought one. You bought at least one. I have bought three, four. Okay. I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, I, have a think pad thing, so. I mean, that seems to be like one of the safest choices to I, go with. I had more think pads than I could possibly afford. <laughs> I love them. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if System 76 makes like, you know, the thin ones and stuff. But. Yeah, they do. Oh, okay. That's pretty cool. I'll have to look into that. They've got a kind of like a MacBook Airish type. Oh, yeah, yeah. Aluminum. Okay, nice. All right, let us call this meeting to order. The rally period has expired. Um, for the next few minutes, we are going to do introductions and show and tell and questions. The demand of every participant is that you introduce yourself and then you either show and tell something or you ask a question. I'll start. Uh, my name is David Wilson. I am the expert facilitator for the Bash class. Um, I'm also the founder of the Software Freedom School. And I am going to, I'm actually going to be teaching. Um, so I will do a, let's see, I'll do a quick show and tell. Um, I'll share my screen and I'm going to cut the available percent of um, a file system from uh, DF. How about that? Uh, so let's say I want to make sure that uh, my temp file system is has at least 20% free. Um, 
I'll use my use percent as my number. Uh, and I'm just gonna use some ugly hacking to get it down to that. Uh, so that's the one, two, three, four, fifth field. Um, delimited on space. Well, must be the sixth field. What am I doing wrong? Five, yeah. I want that 92. Why isn't it giving me that 92? I want that 92. Oh, I know why. I know why it's not giving it to me. I need to use awk for this. Um, I've got a double delimiter in there and awk is the only one that I know of that um, will let you say any white space, no matter how much white space or what kind, regard it as one delimiter. So let's try this instead. This is the one thing that I know how to do with awk. All right, I need to do get just the last line. There we go. And I want to get rid of that percent. So I'll use TR for that. And I will delete the percent character. So that's my that's my percent full. Um, let's see, percent underscore full equals the output of all that business right there. And if I do that, I end up with that. Um, by the way, that was tab, I can't type that fast. Um, so if you type dollar and then start typing the name of a variable and hit tab, it outputs the uh, the variable. You guys are seeing this, right? Yeah. yeah. Good. All right. <laughs> Uninteresting talk if you weren't. Um, so uh, there's percent full. Now, what if I want to turn it into percent free? How would I do that? You got it. A hundred minus. So this is how I do simple math on the command line. Simple integerial math is this easy. If you want to do floating point math or anything more complex, then you need a more complex mechanism. But if all you want to do is be um, adding and subtracting, multiplying, um, or to some extent dividing and getting modulus, um, then you can use this. So my percent free, well, that's not correct at all. No, that is correct. Uh, so I have 8% free on that, um, on that file system. So maybe we can take this and use it as part of our solution to the um, problem that we're gonna solve next week. Cause you're gonna put in a GitLab issue about detecting and responding to a full boot partition. Um, so this, we can use this mechanism to uh, figure out how much free space is available on the boot partition. All right, so that's me. I am, again, I'm David Wilson. That's my uh, show and tell. And I call Corey, go Corey. I'm gonna, okay, can you hear me now that I unmuted my mic? Let me let me mute myself because I'm making all kinds of noise over here. Hey, Rich showed up. Hi, Rich. Um, I'm Corey. Uh, what else do I do? Um, I don't have anything to show. I'm here to learn. Um, so I think I'm going to present all kinds of questions. The biggest one I'm working with uh, Mr. Wilson on is trying to automate the um, update process and uh, I will be providing some 
step-by-step -step instructions of how I go through and update my servers currently and uh, how we can step through and automate some of that as much as possible. Does that make sense? Yep. Okay. I'm going to not put Rich on the spot just yet, so I'm going to hand it over to Chris next. All right. Can you guys hear me? Perfect. All right. So I'm Chris, uh, pretty new to Linux and Bash and all of this. Um, so don't really have anything to share. Uh, I guess my question would be, um, I think I made an issue for it already in, in GitLab, but just uh, it would be cool to see um, running a script in cron tab and then having it email out like a, a notice um, the output of the script as well as um, a notice when the script's complete or when it ran. Um, but I don't know if that's necessarily bash. Hang on. Sorry. It's my fault. It's my fault. Do it again. Oh, say it all again? Say it all again. All right. Well, okay. So, uh, I don't know. I guess I'm Chris. Uh, my question is, um, how to use CronTab to, to run a script as well as email a notice um, to whoever um, that the script ran, um, when it ran, and the results of whatever was ran, whatever script was ran. So, like, if the script was to... I don't Fantastic. know. Does That's that a make great sense? question. It is a great question. Does the server have, is it mail enabled? Uh, is there any sort of mail program on it? I don't know. So, what is, so that's based off of what kind of OS you're running? No, if, or, it, if it's a mail server, does it process mail? I believe so. I, okay. Someone told me that you can you can use CronTap to, to mail out. So, so it should be easy. Well, and then easy, easy. Uh, <laughs> relative, all things are relative. Yes. Yeah. As such things go, it should be easy. Um, so it's going to be. Oh, you're pieces. muted, by the way. You're what? You're muted, by the way. Oh, I'm muted. Right? Yeah. Can you hear Yeah. All right. So I'll right. mute it once he's muted. I'm unmute. I'm unmuted now. Okay. So um, the. There will be two pieces to the answer to your question. Um, I'm not going to try to handle it this week because I want to make sure that I rehearse the whole answer out. Um, there's how do first, how do I mail enable a system? That's an important piece to the question, uh, to answering the question. And I want to get a reasonably complete answer to that. And then the second thing is to answer the question in a way that's useful for people that are running their crons out of um, cron.d and for people that are running their crons as users. Uh, if you're running your crons as the particular user, it's actually a lot easier because then that user just directs their reports wherever they want. Um, if you're running the stuff out of cron.d, then it's a little bit harder, but still uh, completely doable. So I'll depend on both of you to turn your questions into GitLab issues so that I can um, have cromulent answers assembled by next week. And now we can, uh, now we can pick on Rich. Our Glazy 425, are you up, brah? I'll 
there. How about now? Okay. So I'm not, now I'm not muted. Um, let's, let's bang into the table and make the whole world shake. We are now to the portion of the evening where um, I talk about something. Um, what did I decide that I was going to talk about tonight? I decided I was going to talk about init scripts, even though most things are done now with system D. Um, knowing how to write an init script is still seems like a useful skill. And not only does it seem like a useful skill, it's also a good opportunity to teach case and to talk about uh, how we can count arguments and stuff like that. So you may be aware that let's uh, let's get into the git repo here. Git bash programming. Oh, well, let's make a session. Sorry for flying by the seat of my pants tonight. Um, it's just been a busy, busy week. Um, <laughs> uh, and get into session two. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about init scripts. And that's the plan for tonight. Um, we'll talk first about positional arguments. I think that that's where we're going to start when we talk about init scripts. Um, remember, does, how, how long have you been in, uh, in, in Linux? Me? Yeah. Uh, professionally or amateurish? Uh, either one. Professionally, five years, amateurish, probably 10. Okay, so five to 10 years. Chris? Uh, six months. Six months, okay. Um, so Chris has probably never seen a system that wasn't system D. Uh, uh, old days. <laughs> So back in the old days, all of the all of the daemons or services, and the Unix word for service is daemon, um, were started out of the init directory, and that directory was here. All right, so all of your config files are in slash etsy, right? All of the control files for services were in init.d. And then they got linked out of this directory into the various run levels. Let me see if there's still some stuff in here. There is, good, good to know. Um, so these are init scripts. And if we run one, we'll see that they all have the same basic set of expectations. Um, so I'm invoking this init script and notice that it comes back with a usage message. Usage message says, um, run me uh, with start, stop, force, reload, restart, and status. Those are the modes that this init script supports. Start to start the service running, stop to stop the service from running, force reload to give it a kick in the head, restart to give it a less forceful kick in the head and status to find out, are you currently running or are you currently not running? Um, and all of the init scripts support those same basic verbs. Start and stop is where you start with an init script. Uh, and then you add restart as the chaining of stop and start and status is a really nice one to have so that people don't have to use restart uh, crudely because they don't know whether a given service is running or not and they don't know how to launch a, a decent investigation of that service. So once you've formalized your, how you investigate whether the service is running, you should put that into your status command. Um, and, and support status as well as uh, the other ones. So 
these init scripts are all linked in the run levels. Uh, let me see if I can find those. I'm looking for rcx.d. Are they in Etsy? Yep, they sure are. Um, so if I type echo run level, hmm, maybe if I type run level, there it is. Uh, the current run level on this system is five. So the init scripts that control starting and stopping of services in run level five are in rc5.d. If we look at rc5.d, we'll see that there's a buttload of symlinks in there. Those symlinks are named S and K, S for start and K for kill. The kills run first in numerical order, and then the starts run in numerical order. Notice that they're all pointing to init scripts that are where? In Etsy init.d. So that's a pretty neat system. It's all been supplanted by system D, but it's still interesting to know that this bit is here and you can still depend on it. Uh, it, it all still works, uh, just system D works um, faster. Not everything has been system D optimized. Uh, you may decide that your service doesn't need to be system D optimized. So tonight, if all goes well, we're going to learn how to set up a basic system D init script. Uh, we'll probably copy from one of the uh, one of the more simple ones and then deconstruct how it does what it does. Seem like a good plan? Are you coming as root right now? No, heck no. Why do you ask? Well, I just see everything control root root is that normal in the init.d? Um, yeah, everything in here is meant to be launched and done by the system itself. Uh, and since Rich can't talk, there's no point in me having my headphones on. <laughs> um, there, uh, and and uh, if somebody would please keep an eye on the chat room in case Rich uh, tries to type at us. That would be great. Um, I can't figure out for whatever reason how to bring it up. So uh, just keep one eye on it um, in case he is hollering. Okay. I'm, I've fallen and I can't get up. Uh, but it, yeah, it's normal for all of the init scripts. Let's get back in there. It's normal for all of the init scripts and all of the links to be owned by root. No, oh, but see now these are not full control. Not not writable, you mean? Only by the owner, which is root in this case. I, I was just curious. Yeah. The other ones were made right by everybody. Oh, all right. I see what you're saying. Yes, on sim links, the sim link um the sim link is full control for everybody, but the yield is the, um, the lesser of the two permission sets. So you have a permission set for the sim link and you have a permission set for whatever the sim link is pointing at. The effective permissions is the less of the two. Right, exactly. I, I okay. Get it now. Okay. Uh, so we still have a whole bunch of init scripts here that we can take a look at and that we can um, play with and emulate. So let's take a look at a short one. Uh, how about whoopsie? Um, it looks like whoopsie has all this stuff. Um, and it looks like whoopsie doesn't actually have anything in it. Um, hmm. I'm going to guess that whoopsie only starts. So whoopsie's a bad example. Uh, what's the next smallest one? You know what? 
there's a better way to do this. Uh, let's sort them by size. SLH, uh, H is for human readable. This directory, did that get me the, got me the small ones on the bottom? Why aren't, why is it not ordering by size? What's the first column? That's what it looks like it ordered. Even then it's four, eight, 12. Oh yeah, it's not. That's not by size. That's also not by size. Hmm. Am I doing something wrong here? Yeah, uh, you said LS dash uh, LTR. LTR is um, time. Oh, okay. That's time sort. Oh, I want it. Is. I want it sorted by size. Oh no, that's print the size. Capital S is sort by size. Capital S. Thank you. Thank you. SLH. Interactive. Interactive. All right. Let's try the LVM meta D. It's nice and small. I'm looking for something that has the blocks. I want it to have start, stop, restart blocks. So PPD, there we go. Notice that this one has this case thing. Um, also notice that it's doing an include. This is the bash equivalent of an include in case you ever wa uh, wanted that. Um, if you have a set of functions that you depend on and you find yourself copying them around into your different bash files, take them out of the bash files, put them into a functions file and then include that functions file. That way, when you find a bug in your code one day, instead of having to fix it in all of the places where you copied that function, you can, cop you can fix it once in the functions file and it'll automatically be fixed in all of the places where you included it. Did that make sense? It made perfect sense. Okay. Um, let's, shall we take a quick look at that functions file and see the uh, structure of a function? We're not going to do a function tonight, I promise. Um, I, I don't think I could do one off the top of my head, but um, let's take a look. Lib LSB init functions. Um, lib lsb init functions. That's what I want right there. So just real quick, is less just another way of like using like vi or vim or something like that? Is that just yeah, like a and actually view is vi in read-only mode. Oh, okay. Huh. Very cool. Notice that it got the syntax highlighting that vi has, mm -hmm. but it's completely read-only. Oh, okay. So if you... Uh, and it, but it, it still responds to all the standard VI commands. Uh, there is a way to get from view into VI so that you can um, go from reading the file to editing the file directly. Uh, and the same thing with less. I just don't know what that is. So I always pop out and come back in. Um, so this is the init functions. So this is the structure of a bash function. This is the start daemon function, and this is the definition of it. Uh, here's the pit of proc function. Here's the structure of that. So all of those functions, because of that include, let's go back to the, which one was I doing, PPD? PPPD. We can use view. Uh, we'll do we'll do view to get the highlighting. Um, I just went back into the same file. Sorry about that. Sure does. PPT PPPD DNS. Um, so due to this line, which is it's like an include, but it's not called include in bash 
in Bash, it's called sourcing it. Uh, and it reads into this file as if that file were in this file. So it is completely the equivalent of an include. Um, all those functions as of this in, as of this source are now defined for use by this file. So now I depend on arg1 and if arg1 is start, I do nothing. If arg1 is stop, restart, or force reload, I also do nothing. Um, if arg1 is anything other than start, stop, restart, or force reload, I give out a usage message. So this is actually a really good framework and maybe we'll use this to, um, maybe we'll use this as the, uh, the basis of ours. Um, and I don't know how, I, I don't know how I get down to this one. Um, I do know that this phrasing is clumsy. This line continuation symbol is needed because these two pieces all together would be long, but it's actually not needed because the and chainer automatically extends the line. I don't know if I showed you guys that last time, mm -hmm. um, but the double and chain uh, and the double or chain both extend the line automatically. I want to take a look at the LVM2 in that script. Yeah, this is more realistic. Um, so once again, we're including the uh, init functions. And if, so this, this here is test square bracket is an alias to the external program test. If sbin vg change is executable or exit zero, this is an or chain. So if sbin vg change is not executable, we quit immediately. Does that make sense? Okay, I'm checking to make sure that that's executable. If it's not, we exit immediately. We don't try to do anything else. Uh, once again, we're, we're all driven by um, this arg1 and the only arg that this one supports is start because any other arg does nothing and no arg just gives me a usage, usage message saying, all I support is start. Start, that's all I do. All right, so let's, um, let's use that as the frame of a basic init script. Um, and if all goes well, maybe the init script will actually do something productive by the end of the session. Um, my point is, uh, though I have to admit, my point is not to get to a functional init script. My point is just to show the framework of an init script in case you have something that you want to start on every system. Um, if you have something that you want to run that doesn't need to stay resident, we can talk about hacking it into RC local. RC local? That may not be the right place to hack it into. Um, I'll, uh, I'll have to come back to that. Um, all right, so let's use LVM2 as the framework and we're going to drop it into Git, bash programming, session two, example in it script. And we're just gonna build it out so all it does is some echoes. That's all I really wanted to do is some echoes. Um, if that goes fast, then maybe we'll try to tie it into um, gedit or something. 
All right, so let's edit this file, edit it with Vim. All right, this is provides example. It doesn't require anything. Um, this is all actual, all this framing is for uh, system D. This is all expressions of dependencies for system D. And get rid of all this stuff. Don't care about that. Don't care about that. Don't care about that. Don't care about that. And whoops. Oh, that's not what I wanted. Okay. Um, we don't need script name because I'm going to show you a better way to deal with that. Um, we are going to do one test at the very top of the script. We're going to include those init functions. I probably won't use any of them because I actually don't know what all is in there, but I do want to test one thing. And that is, and actually I guess I am going to try to do a bash function. Wish me luck. I'm going to try to do a usage function. Going to copy this here, but we're not going to use script name. We're going to do it what I think is a better way. Um, whenever you launch a program, the only arg that is guaranteed to be defined is arg zero. What do you think arg zero is set to? That's what um, that would be like your dot slash script name. That's the script. Exactly. It's the script name. It's the name of the script that just got invoked. So you can always call this script dot zero and it'll have enough path information that if you need to figure out what the directory of, of dollar zero is, you can use dir name dollar zero. Um, I might go so far as to show you that one. Um, but we're going to say that it supports uh, start whoops, stop, and restart. It doesn't actually support anything just yet, but it will. Um, this greater than means redirect standard out because echo normally sends its messages to standard out, right? So greater than means redirect standard out. Where is it sending standard out to? Address of what? What is two here? Standard, you're close. Standard error. The three standard channels are standard in, which is channel zero, standard out, which is channel one, and standard error, which is channel two. So what we're doing is we're sending out an error message. Since echo normally goes to standard out, we're redirecting that message to standard error so that it goes out where error messages are supposed to go. Um, we do want to exit with a non-zero value. Three seems like a perfectly reasonable non-zero value. Um, so now that that function has been defined, I need to get back to my test. Um, whoops. LT. And I'm checking for dollar number. Anybody got an idea what that might be? What dollar number might be? Dollar number is the number of arguments fed to this program. So it should be one. It should be one. We expect it to be one or more. Um, we can demand it to be exactly one by saying not equal. Instead of saying less than, we could say it's not equal to, and then call the usage function.
That should work. We'll come back and see if that works in a minute. Um, so we're going to say starting and I'm going to use one that's kind of cool. We'll say that the, um, the script is equal to the base name of the init scripts name. Um, base name is like dir name, but instead of being the name of the directory, it is all of the parts of arg zero that are not the directory. I'll show you, uh, we'll, we'll pop out and I'll show you. Um, to end a particular block of a case, use two semicolons. Let me get rid of the rest of this garbage from LVM. Two semicolons ends that block. And we're gonna try a little fancy footwork here. Copy this piece back in. Whoops, I forgot to close my string. You guys were just gonna let me go on like that? All right. I saw the, the colors that apparently it seemed weird. All right, we're wanting uh, and then do the same trick, base name zero. I suppose I could um, I could define service name up at the top instead of rerunning this base name zero. Um, maybe I'll do that in a subsequent version. And that is the end of the those blocks. Whoops, that's not what I meant. That's what I meant. And then on this one, whenever it isn't start, stop, restart. Actually, I want to maybe get status. Maybe. Um, I'm not going to do this force reload. I don't want that in there. What status? Start, stop, restart. I want to support status. Since I've defined how to do usage in the function, I'll call usage there instead. And we'll see if this actually works. Get into that directory with it. Make it executable. Oh, that's that's a bash internal, which apparently I'm not allowed to use in there. It doesn't like me using the bashy um, bashy version of that. Oh, it's because I'm not writing a bash. I'm writing a shell script. It's a shebang, but because it's invoking sh instead of bash, sh is either directed to dash, or it might be directed to born shell, but it's directed to reduce its functionality down to just things that are actually shell script compatible. So the th those things in theory should work across all born shell compatible shell interpreters, which is not just bash, but lots of fish and zish and all the other things too. Um, I only care about bash for the scope of this class. I'm just curious, why did you do, why did you double the brackets? Originally it was just a single bracket. Right. Bash X. Okay, because internals are faster than externals, and because 
this internal uh, or, or the, the square bracket is an internal of bash. Um, it's not an external command. Uh, let me show you with type. See, double square bracket is a shell keyword, which means that my current invocation of bash already knows what to do with a double square bracket. It doesn't have to load a file from the disk. If I do single square bracket, <laughs> it's also a built-in, but it, but it might not have been, doggone it, it might have been an alias to um, the, the one that's in uh, bin. Yeah, really it's in speed and functionality. Okay. Double square bracket does a lot of things that single square bracket doesn't do and it doesn't cost any, any more. Okay. So there's really no good reason not to convert all of your tests over to double square bracket and get the regex support and all the other things that double square bracket does that single square bracket doesn't, does, doesn't do. Okay. okay. So, uh, so that's why I use double square bracket because I'm a bash snob and I can. Uh, all right, so going back to our thing. Oh, hey, look, the function definition worked. <laughs> I just did a function definition off the top of my head and it worked. I'm, I should teach this stuff. Oh, wait. Um, so the function definition worked. It detected that the number of arguments was not one and it called out and gave me a usage message. What do you think it set the exit status to? Three. And how do I find that out? Anybody remember? Dollar question. That's right. Good, good, good. You guys are learning stuff. Yay. Um, all right. So example in its script. Well, it, it, it worked with uh, no arguments. Let's see if it works with an invalid argument. Yay. Let's see if it works with uh, the wrong number of arguments. Yay. So it's catching all sorts of error cases already. Isn't this wonderful? I think it's wonderful. Um, let's see if it does start. Oh, oh, boo. It didn't, actually, I, I, I expected it to work correctly. <laughs> I'm really disappointed right now. So what is, if you do the status, what's your? None of them. The Oh, oh, yeah, let's do that. Three. So it's always hitting usage. It's always hitting usage. Why is it always hitting usage? I wonder if it's not even getting into the main body of the program. Let's find out. This is ugly and hacky, but it is also known to work, so I'm going to um, do it. Find out if I'm actually detecting errors or if I'm just quitting long before I ever get there. Um, got here. I did get there, so I got past my function definition. Since I got past the function definition, there must be something wrong with this, maybe? Could you just comment that out and try running it? And just make sure you pass it one. Yeah, I could. Um, let's uh, dollar at and dollar splat are how you get your um, 
I guess your arguments or your command line. I don't remember which. Um, let's, I want to try this all by itself and then see what happens. I think I'm doing my dollar at and dollar. Oh yeah, I remember. I have to uh, I have to have some stuff to echo back out. So those are the arguments. That's not actually the command line. Those are the arguments. Um, why am I always hitting? I'm passing that test. That what the what that what this all indicates is that I am passing that test. That's not what I meant. Why aren't I getting into either of these blocks? I don't see any problems here. Oh, that's interesting. That should have output dollar at. It didn't. Did you notice that? Uh, it, yeah, yeah. It didn't. It didn't bring out the um, the arguments, which means that it's quitting before before there. Yep. So let's do this. Let's put out some diagnostic information. No margs. Uh, um, and So the number of args is one, <clears throat> that's the command. And it's immediately dumping out and giving me an error message or usage message. You know what I think it is? I think I'm using the wrong, com the wrong comparator. Uh, I think that I'm using the wrong comparison here. Yep. I think I need to be using a numerical comparison because that's a numerical value. I'm using, well, I'm using NE, which I expect to work. Um, Should be in parentheses then? Mm -hmm. 
Uh, parentheses is um, to run an expression like ls or um, or which or true or false, um, and then reduce that expression down to its exit value. Uh, and the expression will still run. It'll generate output and errors and stuff. Um, but for the purposes of the uh, test, it will be reduced down to its exit value and the parenthetical will be replaced with its exit value. Um, hmm. Maybe I should be switching to the single. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to try it really quickly with this, even though that's a string comparator. It shouldn't work, but let's see if it does not equal string. So it's going to compare uh, the number of arguments with the string one. I don't know what's going to happen. Of arguments is a string of, that's one. It should maybe work. We'll see. From a string perspective. Um, let's see if it's stringy enough. Uh, command and it's start, no margs, and I got a usage message. but I don't know which usage message I got. I don't know whether I got a failed to match or, um, or what. <clears throat> so what I need to do is go back into um, the init script and give myself better error handling. This, by the way, this really not knowing what's going on, this is why I rehearse usually. And this is why I don't like flying by the seat of my pants. This is why I like watching this, because it's the troubleshooting where I learn. Yeah. Because I've already picked up a few tips. Good, good. Being able to stick in the echo commands and scripts and the that's genius of getting this far as getting the end. Yeah. So he may think he's messing up. I'm learning. Oh, good. Um, thank you. Very kind. Um, doggone it. Stop it with the wrong bracket, Wilson. That. Right there. I want... Uh, one, two, three, four. There we go. That's what I want. I'm trying to get to a four space indent, which turns out to be really hard in Vim. Um, I'm not it it's uh, it's surprisingly difficult. I need to get. I I don't have a proper Vim RC because I'm not a. I I use whatever's there right. with Vim, um, and and actually with practically every other program too. Um, so what I'm going to, what I'm doing here is I'm figuring out whether I'm failing and going to usage because this eval is failing or whether I'm failing and going to usage because I didn't get a match in the case statement. All right. So I've added a little echo there and I'm going to make this a compound. There's two ways to make a compound. This makes a subshell. And then you can do stuff within it and say um, uh, numargs not one, which it numargs is one. We know it's one. But for some reason, this test is saying that it's not one. Um, and then uh, give the usage message and exit. So this is one way to make a compound using uh, the parenthetical. 
The thing about the parenthetical is it starts a new subshell, and that's not always what you want. So if you want a compound statement and you're not sure you want a subshell, use curly braces instead. That makes the statements within the curly braces compound in that they're all driven by this same joiner and you can put subsequent joiners on and, uh, and, and run stuff after. It makes all the statements compound, but it makes them compound in this shell instead of starting a subshell. Make sense? Yeah. Okay. Um, maybe it would be clearer if I did it this way. Uh, like when you're defining a, um, like when you're defining a function, you define it by creating a compound statement. Um, this, you can, you can now see that this expression, the value of this expression drives this whole compound statement. Sort of like, it's sort of like a do done, but not exactly like a do done. Um, take my word for it. There's, there's two different kinds of compound statements. One's a curly and one's a, uh, parenthesis, the parenthesis gives you a subshell, the curly doesn't. Um, someday it will bite you on the fanny and you'll remember and you'll go, oh, I remember. It's because I'm starting a subshell that I'm losing all my variables. With, with the variables, like the dollar one, like uh, in the case you just did dollar one, but then later on you did the dollar curly one, curly. Like, so you always keep the variable in the curlies? Um, Is that just for, someone told me it's like, just the way that Bash like knows for sure that it's a variable? Yes. A cleaner way? Yes, so um, $1 can always be called like this. Yeah. And as long as you're doing something after the number one that is not a legit name of a variable, that's specific enough. Okay. But if you're doing something after the number one, that could be a legit part of a variable name, like it, like this I, uh, and this N and this G, then you have to have a way of saying my variables name begins here and ends here. Okay. And that's what those curly braces are for. Um, you can always put curly braces around your variable names. It won't hurt anything. It's just absurdly verbose. Okay. Um, all right. So it, it does seem to be that I'm failing here. And I'm going to try... Um, this other test and see if I still fail there because I don't know if you guys saw it, but it said now marks is not one. So that means that even when I'm running it with start, it doesn't think now marks now marks is equal to one, which seems to, Hey, 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 So my test is working now, right. and I don't know why. Somewhere along the way, I changed that test in, in such a way that it actually worked the way that I wanted it to. So what did I do? Nope, I have no idea what I did. EQ, I was testing for not equal. I was, I was testing for not equal before, right. which means that I was failing every time the number of arguments was equal to one. <laughs> Instead of failing when the arguments wasn't equal to one, I was failing when the number of arguments was equal to one, which is exactly the opposite of what I wanted. All right. 
So if number of arguments should be one, and if it's not, give, an error, give a usage message and quit. So now I can take out this compound statement because I don't need a compound statement. I just need to call usage. Get that out of there. It's amateurish, then the most amateurish way possible. Um, all right, so now I'm calling my usage function after I've made sure that there's exactly one argument. And um, notice that starting is with a capital S. So it is not arg1, but notice on all of my others, if I call one of them, it's, it's, it's using arg1 to decide what it's doing. Got that? Is that, is, I, I don't know if that's cool. It seems cool to me. Um, I'm going to change it so that there's a, uh, whoops. So that there's a, a clear invocation here of, of that. Um, I'm gonna leave no matchy, no runny in there uh, for now so that I can make sure that I'm hitting that. Um, since I've got the numargs problem solved, I'm taking that diagnostic message out and I'm gonna take out this too and this. This is getting pretty clean now, it's starting to look good. All right, if I, do, if I say nothing, I get, an, I get a usage message. If I say start, it says it's starting the script. If I say stop, it says it's stopping the script. If I say restart or any other verb that I expect, it says it's doing that. And if I say dance, it says no matchy, no runny, and gives me a, use, a usage message. Um, so it seems like it's handling all the cases that I want it to handle. Um, I'm going to go back and change stop to do something logical. Let's see, is there a, what are we at time-wise? Oh, um, we're, we're way, way, way freaking over time-wise. All right, hopefully this has been illustrative. Um, I'm gonna continue to work on my init script, but we are now in the practice window. And um, so I'm going to push what I have into the repository. I want you to go into your clones of the repository and do a git pull so that you have all the latest stuff. And then I want you to play with this. I want you to write your own init script wrapper and uh, see if you can improve on my methods. While you're practicing, I will play strong bads. Um, I'll just, maybe I'll just bring up a link to it. I don't know. Um, um, strong bad, uh, the dragon. You guys familiar with no strong bad? No strong bad fans? Okay. The practice window opens now. You have a half an hour to practice. I'm gonna pause the um, recording. I'll play strong bet up there and um, and then in in half an hour not half an hour it's because it, we've got to get out of here on time tonight at 815 we'll do outros with show and tell hopefully uh, somebody will go hey you know what I learned tonight I learned this let me show you how, what, let me show you what I learned. I learned how to replay the arguments. Um, I learned how to replay the name of the um, um, script, whatever. Um, and, uh, or ask another question, at which point I will demand that you enter it as a GitLab issue. 
but we'll do that at 8.15. So everybody practice hard for 22 minutes. Let us know once you push it. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to. Push it like a drunk college girl. <laughs> All right. Push it way out there. Pause. How do, I, how do I pause the recording? I don't know how to pause the. That's getting recorded. Stop. How about if I stop share? If I stop share, I should have that control. Resume recording. There we go. All right. Time for outros. Who is ready with a question or a show and tell? <laughs> I don't know. Going. Go ahead. All right. Um, yeah. All right. Wait, let me meet up. Mm -hmm. Okay, do it. All right, cool. So I will share my screen. Uh, this will be the first time sharing my screen. So. Yeah. You guys see my screen? All right, awesome. So, uh, so I pretty much just took a script I already had that I pretty much run every time I start my computer. Um, and it's just to adjust the resolution of my screen because I have a hard time for whatever reason keeping the same resolution. Um, and I realize now it doesn't work the best for this case scenario since it's not something that's like continual. It's just like a one-time run through. Uh, but anyways, that's what I did. Um, so that's what all this extra mumble jumbo is here cool um so yeah so essentially what i did is i didn't make it take two arguments um uh so the second one would be a one or a two essentially um cool. and I, I didn't have enough time to i don't know there's a, obviously a couple different ways that you could go through this but anyways so if i do with a start and i give it a two uh i don't know you guys still see it? Yep. Okay, cool. So, um, so it, yeah, I readjust my resolution um, to a preset I had, which was number two, which is the 248 by 1152. Um, and then if I did a one instead, um, yeah, switch it to 192. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I think if I had more time, I would have tried to do something where – I don't know. I mean, I don't know. That's cool. I would have done more, but yeah. That's cool. I, I hope that you'll put that in the repo when you uh, when you get it debugged to the point where you're happy with it. That's, yeah. I actually really like that. Nice. Nice branching. Thanks. Uh, is there anything else I need to say? Uh, no. Stop, okay. Stop sharing and raise uh, up unless you want me to do a quick share. Um, Mine's gonna be real quick. I don't have much. So. Okay. Well, I, I I decided that I wanted to show something because I like Adam and I like to recommend.